Hi, welcome Jude. Uh, thank you for uh, taking part in this conversation or kind of uh, kind of interview for uh, Biotrip and to uh, discuss your uh, new award with uh, EPSR, EPSRC, which is in collaboration with uh, Cathy Holt at, uh, at uh, Cardiff in the School of Engineering. I, I presume before we start, could you just give a brief overview for the kind of listeners about your career and what your aspirations are as a medical engineer in the UK? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this interview, Richard. So I started out actually doing a physics degree at Manchester um, in the early 90s. Um, and then when I finished that, I, I sort of wasn't really very keen on well, perhaps what was seen as a traditional physics career route. So I had a little think about it um, and then ended up doing a master's degree at the University of Aberdeen in medical physics with information technology, kind of with the purpose of going into uh, using my physics in a sort of applied medical uh, sort of medical applications within the hospital. But then I suppose it's one of those serendipitous uh, turnings in your career that sometimes happen that I was uh, as part of the MSc, we had to do a research project during the summer. And I became interested in doing a project that was being offered by David Hukins, who was at Aberdeen at the time. And this was uh, also with Richard Aston, who was there, to look at um, the stability of the lumbar spine as an oiler column. And this was the first time I'd really met anything about the spine. Um, but really the first time I'd done any kind of research, which I hadn't been interested in before. But I was really hooked by both of those and ended up then staying there to do a PhD. And I suppose over time, um, that's led to an interest in, that's led to my academic career and my interest in understanding the spine. In terms of, uh, in, in terms of going, uh, going forward, how long, you, you've been at Exeter quite a while now, is that right? Yeah, I moved, so I was actually at Aberdeen for quite a long time. So after my PhD, I stayed there um, doing various postdocs. So I think I was there for about 16 years in total. Wow. And then I moved down to Exeter Oh gosh, it must be, be coming up for eleven years ago this mm -hmm. this summer. Time goes fast; it only feels like a couple of years. Um, so I moved down here about ten years ago for a job in the medical imaging mm -hmm. department, uh, teaching on their course. But at the time, that was based within the department in physics and astronomy, which is where I'm currently based at the moment in the biomedical physics group. Okay, okay. So, uh, and, and, and that's quite interesting because my undergraduate degree was in physics. And my, oh, okay. Uh, and my PhD was in physics and my PhD was in pneumatic liquid crystals and light scattering. So nothing, you know, nothing, uh, com nothing to do with bioengineering at all. And like you, I felt there wasn't a really an option in, in, in physics in terms of career or if you didn't, or if you didn't get an academic career, your kind of uh, your prospects were quite limited because there's no big physics industries so there are a few companies that deal with kind of uh, technology and things but and then my partner she had to move to Durham so I got a job in bioengineering at Durham with Tony Unsworth and I've never looked back really mm -hmm. no, yeah. I've, I've never looked back and yeah but yeah it was, it was a good move at the time it was a good move at the time so you have this uh, new award this kind of uh, uh, this image-driven subject-specific uh, spine models. I suppose, uh, kind of, when you talk about the kind of subject-specific spine models, what is the kind of uh, what is the driver behind them? You know, there's a lot of modelling in you know in the spine. There's various kind of different models one can generate. There's the kind of you know Kathy Holt's group has had a you know a history of developing models not only in the spine but in other. Uh, at kind of anatomical areas and then there's the kind of uh, modeling that's done commercially let's say by anybody I suppose what's the driver here what's the kind of you know what's the you know what's the added uh, impetus for, uh, for this particular grant well um, I think that's a good question I mean modeling's really developed as I've seen it over the past maybe couple of decades I mean if you think back 20 years or so it was really uh, and I'm thinking particularly about the spine um, and disc work, it was very much you'd get either a very generic, typical average model, mm -hmm. and then you do a lot of things to it. You might change the properties, you might change the height of the disc, you might change the loads, and you'd see how it behaved. Yeah. And of course, I mean, they were very useful for getting an understanding of how those different parameters affected things in the disc and spine. And then there was a move as, I, I guess, as computing power and pre, uh, in, 
as computing power increased and also as medical imaging technology became more sophisticated and was producing much higher quality images, there was a move towards, particularly in terms of anatomy, in using things such as CT data and then more latterly MRI data to get the geometry of a person's spine. And there was um, then you start to see models coming out where they uh, where the uh, researchers had got some data for a particular person, but then they were doing similar things such as changing the loads, changing the properties to understand. And of course, both of those approaches, one is very generic, uh, and the other one is then very specific to that particular anatomy and there was always that question around well what if you've picked sort of accidentally picked a particular person who has unusual anatomy <clears throat> excuse me and i think part of those questions um and some work i was doing at aberdeen looking at some magnetic resonance images of the spine it sort of started really getting me to actually realize actually how variable the spine is and i don't think i'm gonna say when i was sort of growing up learning about the spine in some early work, you know, you look at anatomy textbooks and you see a picture of the spine and you sort of imagine that everyone looks very similar on the inside, which when you think about how different we look on the outside is probably a little bit naive, but you know, it, it isn't really until you start to look at all the, the images of people and you think we are so different in our curvature in the, uh, I mean, these are things I'm sure, you know, many, many people do realize now that, uh, our anatomy is so different. Of course, our body weights are different. Our muscle capacities are different. And so the way we use our spines are different. And I think it really points to, we need to start exploring how those differences uh, affect the spine, but also how those differences interact. And that's where we you know, really need to get a more sophisticated understanding of that variability in people and how it then affects their function. Um, and so that's where, uh, uh, you know, outside of this immediate grant, my interests are in finding methods for being able to assess and characterize people's spines. So we've been using things like shape modeling mm -hmm. to um, sort of understand particularly like the shape of the vertebra and how that relates to other things such as muscle size and muscle function. And then it's led to this uh, desire to step into that arena of trying to do subject specific models. And I think from a research perspective, it's really important now we've got that capacity, computing power and imaging technology to bring them together to understand more about the spine. But also, I think in terms of the applications, um, so it, there's been a drive, it's not terribly recent, but you know, sort of increasing, I think, in terms of that precision medicine, subject specific medicine, being able to look at an individual patient and say, what is it about them? that is perhaps causing the problem they've got. And then there is there's something that we can modify in that, in that patient that could potentially help them. And that's where I really think we need to start moving towards bringing in as much subject specificity. Um, <laughs> I knew I shouldn't do something with that word in when you can't say it. Um, so we need to start bringing as much of that in as is appropriate. I mean, there's always that challenge with modeling where you know, I mean, you can make it more and more complicated. And actually, are you going too far? So, I mean, I, you know, I do recognize that uh, knowing where that balance is, is a little bit of a challenge, but I don't think we've reached the point where we've got too much sub subject specificity at the moment. So would you envisage, let's say, I don't know, five, 10 years down the line for these models to be used in the clinical arena, or would you think they would be more used in, let's say, a medical company who's designing kind of custom or semi-custom based implants for for looking at a particular so they take a so you'd have a framework they would take a you know a, a set of images or uh, from a particular patient and then you would design something around that and build i don't know a prosthesis or an intervention is that the sort of idea that would be that these models would be used for in a kind of more clinical sense and application based sense well, I think they've got, I think they would have use in both, but maybe not immediately. And I think that comes down to the, some technical issues, um, which I can outline. So I think, so for example, in our project, um, we are, for example, when we get the anatomy, we're going to be using magnetic resonance imaging. And there's two reasons for that. One, it doesn't produce an ionizing, ionizing radiation dose. So it's going to be more ethically appropriate for you know, the type of patients that we're thinking about. And also it gives us information about the soft tissues, which is really useful. 
But the, the problem is that uh, within our project, we're going to have to manually segment the anatomy to produce the models. And that, as I'm sure you know, is going to be really time consuming. So in terms of where that, uh, you know, where we'll be perhaps by the end of the project, where we hope to have um, some idea about the, where we hope to validate it, produce the methods, validated the methods, and looked at where um, possible applications are. If we're still at the point of manually segmenting, then I don't see it being of really strong practical use to, you know, for example, patients and clinics. I think it would be too time consuming mm -hmm. to really see that being used as a common approach for understanding a patient. But exactly to say, it could be in terms of um, where you have perhaps a more, where you want something more customizable for a very specific patient. Uh, if you're talking about implants and so on, it could be. At, that that is something that, that the time effort becomes appropriate to produce a really customised implant that's going to have a much better yeah. uh, outcome for that patient. However, I think what I would hope is, um, although I'm saying that we're going to be manually segmenting, I mean, there is loads of work out there, many groups looking at automatic segmentate. We've done a little bit ourselves. Now, that's quite well developed if you are using CT images. And uh, there's many groups that can produce um, a model of the spine automatically pretty much automatically from a CT image. Because we're using MR, and as I said, there's a, you know, good reasons for using the MR, those, those um, sort of uh, computing, um, computer vision techniques aren't quite so well developed. Okay. But I think eventually those two technologies, as they develop, you know, what we're doing and what other people are doing with subject specific models and the computer vision um, software and capability, once they're advanced enough, then I think it would be possible in the future, maybe in, yeah, perhaps in a time scale of 10 years or so, to take an image and the MR machine might even be linked up to a computer that spits out your model and solves it within the hour so that it can provide data about um, the loading and any, you know, sort of hot spots as it might be within the loading within a particular patient. And then I think it could start to be used perhaps more routinely in clinics if it's shown to provide some useful information for you know, di diagnosis and prognosis. Yeah, uh, uh, other, I was talking to one of your fellow uh, advisory board members, uh, Rod Barrett from uh, Griffith University in, uh, in, in, uh, in Australia, and they're developing some spine models. There's to do with uh, spinal cord injury and the idea of a digital twin. I suppose these uh, these sorts of models could also be used in that particular scenario where you're you know, where you almost develop from start to finish digitally rather than kind of using uh, laboratory based experiments and things like that, particularly in the regulatory science environment, which is very much the buzzword at the moment. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's something that seems to be, you know, it's sort of a new thing calling things digital twins. Um, I think it's a very exciting area. I, I read something myself uh just yesterday talking about clinical trials mm -hmm. starting to be brought into a sort of artificial intelligence type um sort of environment um and it really brought home to me you know how quickly this this field is moving in terms of using computers to do things that we couldn't have envisaged i think even five ten years ago um so absolutely i think it's you know where this field is going and perhaps where our models might fit in at some point in the future. Absolutely I think yeah I think it's a really exciting area this kind of link between kind of trials uh, the you know the power of as you say the power of computing as you've already mentioned these advanced models in which you look at a range of people and you have a kind of population of mm -hmm. models that you can use and test hypotheses and things like that. I think it's a I think it's a really exciting, uh, really exciting area. You can offer, and of course, you can tease out things that you can never hope to get out of a clinic, you know, a physical clinical trial, because you can interrogate the models, you know, you know, in a far, in a far better way physically than you could uh, perhaps, you know, by doing a trial, let's say, of a prosthesis over a number of years, to, as you did with uh, as people have done with total disc replacements in the two thousand mm. big, uh, uh, big clinical trials. So, so you so you envisage this to be kind of you know develop and a kind of step change in the way we uh, develop model. I suppose, I suppose, where would you see this? I suppose the final question: Where would you see this in twenty years? You know? Well, I, I suppose my vision is a little bit like 
uh, sort of alluded to a little bit that I can sort of see um, if it's shown to be useful. Uh, and of course, that is the question. Um, I mean, that's something even our referee said, you know, well, what will the use be? And it, of course, there's always, you know, a little bit of a chicken and an egg. Uh, I mean, we've talked to various people who are involved with assessing patients who have said it would be useful to be able to know what the loads are in the spine. Uh, question about, you know, are we getting abnormal load sharing between the discs and the be an indicator of why people are, are, are getting pain because there's a normal loading on structures uh, that um, yet that is normal loading that's sort of causing some dysfunction. So the, there is a bit of a pull, but until you've got good tools that allow you to measure these things, it's difficult then to really say this would help us in terms of diagnosing patients. And so I think the sort of if I could just sort of step before that is, I suppose after we've finished our project and we've got our methods and we've validated them, then of course the, the next stage is really to look at, well, what information can we get from these models and how does that information relate to particular patient characteristics? Can it be used, for example, to stratify back pain patients mm -hmm. in a way that might indicate that there are certain groups that do have a loading abnormality and then what would be a sensible way of dealing with that, whether it's designing a particular implant that can help them or whether it's suggesting that particular physical therapy could be useful. So I think there are some questions that need to be answered, but assuming that the models can provide some really useful clinical information or some useful information for um, surgery or prosthetics um, and orthotics, then it would be, my hope is that it will be, become something that's very automated so that you can go and have a scan your data is sent to a computer, the computer produces everything, it produces the model, the mesh, um, it uh, perhaps some, has some other information about your motion, um, or, I mean, we're going for, so in our model, we're not implicitly modeling the muscles, um, it's, sort of, it's one of the novel aspects of what we're doing, but there's other approaches that could be used. So I see this is, you know, something that eventually become very automated, and then the information could be sort of assimilated into something that is gives an in, a sort of biomarker of what mm -hmm. is it about this participant. So there's a hot spot here, or there's an abnormality there, or, or at least suggesting that there may be, and maybe indicating that some further um, actual sort of clinical tests then need to be looked at, or some further imaging, or something. It's sort of you know a, a prompt, as it were, to say look a little bit further in this bit this is where there may be a problem okay okay thank you very much for that and congratulations once again on your thank award you. epsrc and i look forward to sitting on the advisory board for it thank you very much thank you